Welcome to the Walk Worthy Podcast, a podcast by Hespler Baptist Church, located in Cambridge, Ontario. Our local church exists to make disciples who walk worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. We hope and pray that this is an encouragement to you and to anyone else you share this with. Good morning, everyone. It's been a delightfully full morning already. Thank you to everyone who has led us thus far. And we trust that the Lord has more in store for for us from his word as we continue and worship together. Back in 2011, a movie was released based on a book by the same title called Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. I remember watching it vividly because of the unexpected twist at the end, which I'm about to ruin for everyone who has never seen the film, so you're welcome. It's a fictional story, but it does draw on true events to tell a tale about a young boy who sadly lost his daddy during the attack on the World Trade Center on 9-11. While he was alive, the little boy's dad, his name is Oscar, his dad used to create pretend missions, treasure hunts, quests for him to find a secret lost part of the city of New York. And after his dad dies, Oscar finds a strange key in a box that belonged to his dad. And he becomes convinced that his dad has left him one final quest, one final treasure hunt. And what this does is it drives Oscar out all over New York City. In most of the movie, you're following Oscar's footsteps, but it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel comfortable watching this boy who is far too young wandering throughout this massive city. He's talking to strangers. Boys and girls, he's doing things that your moms and dads would tell you never to do. He's going into strange people's homes by himself. And no one's watching over him. And the whole time you're watching the movie, you're wondering, where's his mom? And through the eyes of this sad and angry little boy, it seems that mom is too heartbroken and she's too sad and too distant to be able to care for a little boy who's just missing his dad. So you're sitting on the edge of your seat just dreading that something terrible is going to happen to Oscar, hoping that it will never happen. And at the same time, you're feeling both frustrated uh, at his mom, but also devastated for his mom because she's lost her husband. So the movie goes, following the steps of Oscar as he navigates this massive, dangerous city that never sleeps. And then comes the twist, a profound, powerful, and beautiful twist. What you don't realize is that for almost the entire movie, you've been seeing through the boy's eyes. But near the end, the viewpoint shifts from Oscar to his mom. And when you're allowed to see through the mom's eyes, you see just how much she actually has been paying attention. You see how much she actually has been present. The whole time, it seems Oscar is all alone, but the truth is his mom has been there the whole time. Every time he leaves the apartment, she's following close behind Before he goes to meet with anyone on this quest to try to find the next clue, she's already gone ahead of him to meet that person herself and to prepare them on how to handle her grieving autistic son. She's already seen everything he's going to see. She's already been everywhere he's going to go. She's always there knowing everything that is happening to him. She has not forgotten about her son even for a second. Yet as the story shows... When we can't make sense of the world, when we're hurting, when we're sad, when we're angry, it's incredibly difficult to see even the love of those who care for us the most, isn't it? 
And that's not only the case with earthly parents or with lifelong friends. It's also true with our Father in heaven. When life is at its absolute worst, when hopes of improvement are dashed, when we're groaning in agony, it seems like God is absent and silent and distant. In moments like those, we need a twist like the one in the movie, a powerful, profound, beautiful twist, a shift in viewpoint. One that shows God plans to redeem us up close and personally. One that shows us God is there and he's always been there and he isn't going anywhere. The truth of the matter, whether we see it, whether we feel it, is that God plans to redeem us up close and personally. He's there in the smallest of details. He's there preparing those he will use to accomplish his purposes. He's there and he has been there the whole time. Those are the three camera angles the text we're about to read gives us. And through each one, we'll look for evidence that truly God plans to redeem us up close and personally. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. We had an excellent summary of this chapter from Emily and the kids' story. But I want you to hear it from the scriptures in full. So Exodus chapter 2, it's page 45 and 46 in the Blue Bibles. Let me read that for us as we continue in worship and before we hear God's word, let me pray. Father, for your glory, for the fame of your beloved Son, into whose hands you have given all things, and by the power of your Spirit, would you bless the reading, preaching, hearing, and obeying of your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 2, this is what the Holy Spirit says. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took from him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call for you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, well, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, 
then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The passage we've just read zooms, picks up and zooms in where Exodus 1.22 concludes. There Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And then chapter 2, verse 1, we read the story of one family's response to these awful circumstances. Over the joy of marriage, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. Over the joy of a birth of a baby, in verse 2, the woman conceived and bore a son. We have this threat of death. The thought of losing a baby is a parent's worst nightmare. That's made even worse when there's no reason to lose a healthy baby. This Levite woman, when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. And thus we are introduced to a key figure in God's plans to redeem his people. A helpless baby who needs protected from a tyrant serpent king. And in this introduction, we are given our first camera angle as evidence that God plans, us, plans to redeem us up close and personally. He's there in the smallest of details. He's sovereignly orchestrating the specifics. He's there in the smallest of details. God is there ensuring the success of this baby boy being hidden for three months. Can you imagine how hard that would be in the middle of the night when it's quiet and Baby cries out for something to eat. Can you imagine trying to keep it hidden? Family Sundays aren't so hard after all when you compare them, are they? But God is there making sure that happens. God is there as the boy's mom weaves together a basket of papyrus wreaths. God is there as the mom waterproofs the basket with the Gore-Tex of the day, vitamin and pitch, so it doesn't leak when she puts it into the Nile. God is there as the boy's mom seems to strategically put the basket among the reeds at the right time, at the right place, so that the right person would come along and respond in the right way. While the older sister watches on in 2-4 to know what would be done to him, that's precisely what happens in verse 5 as it continues. Now the daughter of Pharaoh, the daughter of the king, who wanted that little boy to be drowned in the Nile, came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked beside the river. And I ask, why that detail? Who cares where the servant woman were walking? Well, perhaps it's to get us to think what would have been the case had Pharaoh's daughter's maidservant seen the basket first. They were just servants. Perhaps they would have just followed orders. Would a slave be as quick to disobey the king as a daughter is about to do so? God is in the details. Humanly speaking, this is a close call, but God is there in the smallest of details. The young woman take a walk while Pharaoh's daughter washes, maybe for physical reasons or spiritual reasons, maybe both. And the text goes on in verse 5. that She was the one who saw the basket among the reeds, and then she sends her servant woman, and she took it. And I want to pause there. I want to ask a question. Boys and girls, I want you to look up here for a second. Boys and girls, right here. Let me see your eyes. That's better. You came up here, you heard a story, and I want to see how closely you were listening. When Mrs. Rendell was reading the story, do you remember how Moses' basket was described? Do you remember the word that was used? to? Dis it wasn't just called a basket, it was called something else. Does anyone remember? Shout it out if you think you know. Let me give you a clue. Like Noah's Ark, yes, very good, Brigham. We're supposed to think of Noah's Ark here. Moms and dads, this story is bang on. The only other time the word translated basket in Exodus 2 
is used in the Bible is Genesis 6 to 9, which is the story of Noah's ark. The God who was with Noah, giving him plans, guiding his hands, saving him from the deadly waters, is the same God who was with Moses, guiding his mother's hands, guiding the princess's footsteps to save this little boy from the deadly waters of the Nile. We saw a correspondence to this today as Marinus was brought up from the waters of baptism, saved from the judgment of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's all connected. And all the way back in Exodus, God is there in the smallest of details, making plans to redeem us up close and personally. He's sovereignly orchestrating the very moment of verse 6, which says, when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying, and her heart melts. She took pity or compassion on him, and she said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And you know, I was under the wrong impression about Pharaoh's daughter before I came to this text, and my opinion of her greatly changed. She wasn't a fool. She wasn't tricked. She knew this was a Hebrew boy. Maybe the way he looked, or the clothes he was wearing, or maybe she checked to see if he was circumcised, or the older Hebrew girl lingering nearby, it would all have made it really clear to her. And by God's grace, she is not like her father. She's more like the Hebrew midwives who feared God and refused to follow Pharaoh's ruthless decree. In fact, as others point out in Exodus 12, 38, I quote, when the Israelites finally made their exodus from Egypt, many other people went up with them. Very likely, still quoting, at least some of those people were Egyptians. This is not surprising because God has always, has always planned to save people from every tribe, every language, every nation. So when the boy's sister, this is Miriam here, not named yet, when she speaks up in verse 7, this compassionate princess, she's already on board. And his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call for you a, a nurse from the Hebrew woman, woman to nurse the child for you? What a clever girl. Notice her emphasis. It's not on the child. It's on Pharaoh's daughter. Twice, she says, for you. God is in the smallest of details. And shockingly, given the circumstances, given that this is Pharaoh's daughter, we read in verses 7 and 8, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go! So the girl went and called the child's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And truly, if we cannot see God's providence on majestic display here, I don't know how we're going to see any of his other workings in this world. Not only does Pharaoh's princess daughter disobey her father, she's willing to pay the Hebrew baby's mother from daddy's credit card to nurture her own Hebrew son. As commentators point out, here we have a foreshadowing of the Hebrews plundering the Egyptians, which happens later in 1236. And even more than this, in verse 10, when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. And in all of these details, from 1 to 10, from his heritage, the early circumstances of his birth, his name, his being raised in Pharaoh's house, this child is clearly destined for significance. He's a Levite on both sides. I quote, the tribe that showed itself readily loyal to Yahweh, the tribe that would supply the priests to bridge the holiness gap between God and Israel, and the tribe selected to provide most of Israel's regular court judges. This is Moses' pedigree. His life has been spared in an unusual way. His name means a son or to beget a son and is a common Egyptian name. At the same time, it also sounds like draw out, which is what happened to Moses. He was drawn out of the water, but Moses would also be used by God to draw his people out from Egypt. And as hard as it would have been for Moses' mother to give him up, through her, God had spared the life of her son, who though a Hebrew would be raised in the palace of Pharaoh. And as we heard earlier in Acts 7.22, he was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, which would have been hard to top at this time in history. 
And when you take all of this together, there's no way, no other way to look at this but to see God there in the details of a Hebrew husband and wife and the conception of a baby and the labor and delivery of a baby, the hiding of a baby, the protection of a baby, the raising of a baby, and the placing of this boy in the house of Pharaoh. Who could do this but God? His fingerprints are all over this. He's right there in the smallest of details. He plans to redeem us up close and personally. He's not distant. He's intimately involved. He's not far. He's close. And can you see the same hand of providence as was at work in Moses' life and in Israel's life as you look back on your own? If you're a Christian, I would encourage you to look beyond Moses to God sovereignly orchestrating the birth of another saving baby, the saving baby, as evidence of his plans to redeem us up close and personally. God was in the smallest details of Christ's birth, which Moses' birth foreshadows. And God was in the smallest details that resulted in your hearing the gospel. A random YouTube video pops up against all the algorithms that fit in the system so that someone can hear the gospel and be brought to Christ. He's in the details. And all of them, to save a people for himself, to save you. He's there. Now, seeing God there in the smallest of details is much easier when things are looking up, is it not? If I were a Hebrew and a slave in Egypt at the time, and news about this had reached my ears, I'd be pretty excited. And you would be too, because maybe God's raising up another Joseph. Maybe God's raising up another uh, individual to spare God's covenant family from utter ruin. And so we see this is good. And we can see the details and God working when things are going well. But what about when the wheels fall off? What about when life goes belly up? The Hebrews are on a roller coaster. So is Moses, and our own lives have that feel as we wait for the consummation of God's redemption. At the beginning of Exodus, God's promises are unfolding. In verses chapter 1, 1 to 7, the family becomes a nation. There's a massive baby boom as God's word to Abraham about many descendants unfolds. So far, so good. But then a king who disregards Joseph comes into power, a serpent-like king who wages war against God's people. Public policy is enacted to oppress the Hebrews, which doesn't work. A private command is issued for midwives to kill baby boys, which doesn't work. A public decree is given to chuck all of the boys into the Nile, but it doesn't work because one ends up in the palace. So maybe things are going to turn around, but no. Not if verses 11 to 22 are any indication. And here we look closely through the second camera angle for evidence that God plans to redeem us up close and personally. First, he's there in the smallest of details. Second, he's there preparing those he will use. Even if it doesn't seem to us that things are going in the right direction. God is taking up his instruments of mercy. He's forging them the way that he sees fit. He's using them the way that he sees fit. He's there in this preparation. But this is not in the way that we expect. And when God's ways don't match our expectations, all the more reason we need to see that he's actually there in the details, planning to redeem us up close and personally, preparing those he will use to accomplish his purposes. Between verses 10 and 11, apparently 40 years go by, and Moses is all grown up now. We fast-forwarded, we skipped over decades of Moses' life, and you're, you're thinking, Kinder would really like to know what sort of went on there. Well, God in his word doesn't tell us all that we would like to know. He tells us all that we need to know. In verse 11, we read, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. Now, boys and girls, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Prince of Egypt. Maybe some of you are older have seen it. I don't know if you'll ever watch the story of the Prince of Egypt. But they get the story wrong. In the story, it's like a surprise for Moses to find out he's a Hebrew, but he knew the whole time. And he cares deeply about what's happening to his people, his people being mentioned twice in verse 11. In verses 11 and 13, he's out investigating day by day the plight of his people. 
And as Stephen puts it in Acts 7.23, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. As Hebrews 11 reads, by faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. But though Moses has great potential, and though we see him rightly siding with his oppressed people rather than the power and pleasure of Egypt, things do not go well. Verse 11 continues, he saw an Egyptian, being a Hebrew, one of his people, and he's looking this way, and he's looking that way, and he sees no one, and he strikes down the Egyptian, and he buries him in the sand in a shallow grave. As Stephen puts it again in his speech, he was supposed that he supposed that his brothers brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Verses 13 and 14 show that how this plays out. The, the, the Hebrew rejects him. You made you a prince and a judge over us. You're gonna kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And Moses is afraid and thinks, uh oh. Everybody knows. But there's another misunderstanding, misunderstanding revealed here as well, I believe, and I think it's Moses' misunderstanding. As the outcome and journey God takes Moses on suggests, this is not the way. Moses, with yet no call from God, with yet no word from God, seems to act according to the flesh, acting in the heat of the moment, covering up what he had done. And much ink has been spilled assessing and judging Moses' actions here. And if you want to wade into that, I'll let you do that on your own. For now, I'll simply quote the following. Indeed, many Christian commentators from Tertullian to Aquinas have sought to clear Moses from the charge of murder. But that does not change the fact that what he did was wrong. It was wrong because it was not God's will. God had not yet called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And it was wrong because it was not God's way. God had not commanded Moses to take up arms against the oppressor as if somehow he could liberate Israel one Egyptian at a time. Later, God would smite the Egyptians himself but that it was his business and the time had not yet come, end quote. So in the meantime, Moses needs to run away. The threat his mother tried to avoid, the threat turned aside by Pharaoh's daughter, has raised his ugly head once and again. The Pharaoh who wanted him dead because he was a Hebrew boy wants him dead because he murdered an Egyptian and by doing so threatened to overturn the whole kingdom. So the hopes of the Hebrews are dashed. Moses flees and the Israelites continue in this daily grind of awful slavery. And it's at moments like these we desperately need the Spirit's help to see with the eyes of faith. Because in the meantime, God is there planning to redeem us up close and personally. He's there preparing those he will use. Moses has been drawn out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter. He's been rejected by the Hebrews. And now in verse 15, he's driven out of the land by Pharaoh himself. What this tells us is that Moses' experience is going to match the experience of all those God will call Moses to lead. The Israelites would be drawn out of Egypt and go through the waters to the mountain of God. Pharaoh would eventually be compelled to drive them out because of the plagues that Yahweh inflicts on them, and then he'll try to kill them. The people will grumble and complain against Moses. The place where Moses spends 40 years in the wilderness is the same place Israel would spend wandering in need of a shepherd, in need of provision, which God would give to them through Moses. And in all of those experiences, God is there preparing the one he will use to redeem his people. He's up close and personally involved in this. And it won't be done in the way that Moses initially tried to. He won't fight for the Hebrews, but the warrior God of the Hebrews will. God will use Moses, but in the way that God wants to use Moses, not in the way that Moses thinks. So Moses is taught by God and begins to learn some key lessons as he sits down by a well in the land of Midian. And perhaps you recall how it is that Moses is later described. He's described as the meekest man who ever lived. How does someone who lived like 
who lived 40 years like royalty, who has the world's best education, learn to become the meekest man who ever lived? The answer is four decades in exile. Four decades as a nobody. There, in Midian, he learns to continue to stand with the oppressed, but in a more measured way than when defending the Hebrew back in Egypt. Look at verse 16. We're introduced to this new character, a priest of Midian, who had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses, he's courageous. He cares about the oppressed. He stood up and saved them and watered their flock. He learns to provide for those in need by caring for the sheep of his girl's father. He's slopping water from a well into troughs. And certainly not for the world's best and brightest of animals. These are sheep. And he doesn't even get a proper thanks. There's a kind of funny exchange that follows. My wife was showing me a video yesterday. I don't know if you ever watched the Holderness parodies and songs or whatever, but there's these parodies. And she said, you got to watch this one. And the title of the video is All Dads Do This. And it's about how a lot of men of a certain age wear quarter zips and they give these weird waves when they're driving in the car. And there's things that, boys and girls, there's things that mom and dad does that embarrass you. We know that. But, and that makes you feel awkward. You get it, especially in front of your friends. But sometimes you make us feel awkward. And that's been going on for thousands of years of Exodus 2 is any indication. In verse 18, these girls go home to their father, Ruel. The name means friend of God, although... This priest is not a priest of Yahweh, but of the local gods of the place of Midian. And like any household conversation that happens when someone comes through the front door, dad says, what are you doing? How are you home so early today? What's going on? And they say, an Egyptian. Maybe Moses' accent or his dress. They don't know he's a Hebrew yet. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. And guess what, dad? He even drew water for us and watered the flock. They're pretty emphatic about that detail. It's an unusual behavior. And then I can kind of picture dad like looking through his seven daughters to see the guy so that he can meet the guy and introduce himself because surely his daughters have extended him an invitation to at least get him fed for his trouble, but no. In verse 20, well, where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he might eat bread. In other words, where in the world is he? Go get him before I die of embarrassment. Good grief, have I not taught you anything? This is how Moses is received after 40 years in Pharaoh's house. I think the Lord is trying to teach him some things. And following this, God provides Moses with a place to settle. It's the home of a shepherd where he will learn to lead and watch a flock. God provides Moses with a spouse, Zipporah. He learns to provide for and protect his wife. God provides Moses with a son. He learns how to raise a firstborn child, which is very important because Israel is God's firstborn child. In all of this, God is there preparing this one through whom he will save his people, this one God will use to deliver Israel out of Pharaoh's hand This one God will use to provide water for his flock in the wilderness. But before that happens, Moses is going to be there for just a little bit. And the name he gives to his son sums this up well in verse 10. There's hope as Moses is named by Pharaoh's daughter with a steam of drawing out. But in verse 22, these hopes seem dashed as Moses is far from Egypt and names his son Gershom, for he said, I've been a sojourner in a foreign land. Yet as we look back at this, do we not see God's hand working for Moses' good and for the good of his people? In God's timing, Moses goes through the exact training program he will need for the call he will one day receive. And when we know God does this, we can trust him with holy patience to be used in his time and his way in our own lives. When we know God does this, we can thank him for, with gratitude for using sinners such as we are for his purposes. 
when we know that God chooses to work not through the wise and powerful ways of this world, but through what the world would consider weak and foolish, we can look for God to humble us. And we can begin to humble ourselves under his mighty right hand. Brothers and sisters, God filters his leaders. He's in no hurry with his servants. God will forge his instruments of mercy to be used in the purposes of saving his people for his own glory. And if you are an old man or an old woman or a young man or a young woman and want to be used by God, and I hope you do, then prepare for obscurity. Get comfortable in wildernesses. Prepare for years of being honed. And expect to suffer. If God's own son, the greater Moses, was perfected through suffering, should we expect anything less as we follow in his footsteps to make his name famous? This is God's way. And he knows what he's doing. And he's there in the smallest of details, and he's there up close and personally preparing those instruments of mercy he will use in his hands He's there, and he's working. But that's all well and good, you might say, for someone like Moses. He gets to grow up in Pharaoh's house while the rest of the Hebrews were slaves. He goes to Midian, and sure, that's not great, but at least he doesn't have to worry about his son being thrown into the Nile like the rest of the Israelites who are still there. And while he's there, For another 40 years, Hebrews are living and dying in slavery as they have for centuries. What about them? And behind that question is the real question, what about me? What about the hardships of my life? What about my burdens? What about my groans? What about my cries? Where is God in that? Sure, I can see him there in the small details of Moses' life. Sure, I can see him there preparing Moses to one day lead God's people out of Egypt. But what good is that to me here? What good is that to me now? Where is God for me? Well, consider the third angle with me in verses 23 to 25. Yeah, it's true. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, nothing's changed. In fact, I can't even imagine how rough life must have been for these poor people. We sense the hardship from the fact that many days passed during those many days, decades. We're coming up on 430 or so years of this. And even though the king of Egypt dies finally in verse 23, The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. They're crying out for rescue. This is intense. The Bible doesn't shy away from giving us language to talk to God when we're desperate for freedom and comfort and relief. How long is it going to be, O Lord? Are you going to forget me like forever? That's the Psalms. Go look there this afternoon. You'll find it. God gives his language and talk to him when life is this bad. Now, the only reason we can be comforted in using this language is because of what verses 24 and 25 tell us. God is there the whole time. He's been there the whole time, and he is not going anywhere. Notice this striking contrast in the text with me. In the previous verses, different people hear, different people see, and different people know. Pharaoh heard about Moses murdering the Egyptian. Moses' mother saw that he was a good baby. Pharaoh's daughter saw the basket. Moses saw the Egyptian beating a Hebrew. He saw no one was there and murdered the Egyptian. Moses' sister wants to know what would be done to her baby brother. Moses realizes that Pharaoh knows what he did. These are all the same verbs. Different people hear, different people see, different people know, but there's only one who hears and sees. Who hears and sees and knows. And it's God. 
the whole time God has been there. And he has heard the groaning of his people. Their cry for rescue came up to God. Don't gloss over that. As they are bent low in the dust, they have an audience with God most high. The whole time. And that, in and of itself, is a comfort. He's there. He's listening. He's not deaf. I heard a counselor say recently that most people equate being loved to being heard. God hears you. In the name of Christ, you have access to his throne room. You have his ear. He hears the whole time. In addition to this, the whole time God has seen the people of Israel. His eye has been drawn to them because he loves them. He made them his. They belong to him. And he will never take his eyes off of his beloved covenant people. And if you're here this morning as someone who's not a Christian and you're saying, well, I, I'm, I'm not yet one of God's people, then I want you to know that just like his father, when Jesus saw the crowds of people in his ministry, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He sees. And he has compassion. In addition to this, God knew. Back in chapter 1, verse 8, as one of our life groups wonderfully noted this week, back in chapter 1, verse 8, there's a king who arose who did not know Joseph, who had no regard for the Hebrew people. And then here in 225, God knew. He knew every blister. He knew every unjust stroke. He knew every bitter tear cutting a path down their dust-covered faces. He knew every shriek of every mother who lost a baby boy. He knew the heartache of a husband trying to figure out how to console his wife amidst his own grief as he was being sent off to build cities for the Egyptians. He knew. He's there, and he's been there the whole time. He hears, he sees, he knows. I know that this would provide profound comfort to us to know the God who is there, who is up close and personal, unfolding his plans to redeem you up close and personally. But you might ask, what good is this when my circumstances haven't changed? That's a good question. And I wish to gently but clearly say to those who are asking such a question today, it makes all the difference in the world. Consider the alternative. Hopelessness isn't unchanged, difficult circumstances. Hopelessness is there being no God who hears, no God who sees, and no God who knows. Hopelessness is there being no twist at the end of the movie when you realize that someone has been there the whole time. Hopelessness is that little boy being all on his own. Hopelessness is our being all on our own, but thanks be to God, we are not. And this in an even greater way than the people of Israel experienced. In the old covenant, God heard their groans, which is remarkable in and of itself. In the new covenant, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, who doesn't just hear our groans, but who actually offers up groans to the Father for us when we can't even string three words of prayer together. Someone sent a picture that I saw this week of a page. Dear God, tear splashes, amen. Sometimes that's all we can manage. But it makes all the difference to know that God sees and God hears and God knows. 
and the Spirit knows how to pray for us better than we know how to pray for ourselves. And do you think God the Father hears this in light of what God the Son has accomplished on the cross? Beloved, God is the God who is there. And if you're not a Christian here with us today, you could know such closeness with God, such fellowship with God. You could have his ear and have his eye and have his mind fixed on you as one of his beloved children. Come to Christ today and experience this goodness for yourself. A goodness that is not merely God passively observing everything that happens to us. Because believe it or not, I haven't even touched on the best part of these final verses. And with this I will end. Not only does God transcend all the human parties in his hearing and seeing and knowing, there's one thing that God does that no one else is doing. In verse 24, God remembered. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And his remembering isn't like our remembering something that we have forgotten. Boys and girls, you've been so good and patient this morning, but I know that you can probably think of a time when you ask mom and dad for something and they promised and they forgot. And you probably reminded them about 47 times. That remembering that we experience isn't like this remembering. God doesn't forget anything. He knows everything. So what does remembering mean? Remembering means, someone puts it, application. Remembering means putting into effect. Remembering means acting. For God to remember his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doesn't mean he just sits there and listens and sees and knows. It means he's going to respond on the basis of the promises that he has made. And this is far more than remembering, than acting in response to the ancient oppression that we understandably are so far removed from. God's remembering his covenant encompasses the whole of the Bible. In Luke chapter 1, when Zechariah is told he would have a son who would prepare the way for the Lord, listen to his praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. When Mary is told that she would bear the Savior, she praises God with these words, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. You see, the Exodus is just the preview But when the fullness of time had come, in remembrance of his covenant, there is a greater exodus. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. In remembrance of his covenant, Christ has come. And through him, God will restore all that sin has ruined. God is restoring all that sin has ruined. And friends, we are in the last days. This is the chapter right before the final chapter that goes gloriously on and on without end. And all of the promises that God has made from Abraham all the way through all the way to Christ, are yes, and they are amen in him. He sees, he hears, he knows, he remembers, he will bring all of this to completion, and while we wait, he is the God who is with us. And he will not forget. He is there, he is here, and he will never leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. And we have some very fitting words to sing in conclusion to impress these realities upon us. So 
you would come and lead us again, we would be grateful.